and welcome to Zoom with Zarni. I'm Dustin Zarni, Democratic Elections Commissioner for Onondaga County. And uh, this is my weekly interview show uh, where I interview lawmakers and uh, uh, democracy advocates on uh, what's going on in Onondaga County and throughout New York State. Very happy to have uh, on my program uh, this week, Erica Smithka of the League of Women Voters. She is a, a great advocate. She's been on our program before. And we have a great conversation about uh, what the League of Women Voters is. The history, by the way, has the Central New York, uh, you know, uh, tie in as well. And also what uh, they're hoping to talk about and to do in the next uh, uh, legislative session. It's a great, um, great uh, conversation. So please join me uh, later on in the program for that uh, interview. Uh, a few things to catch up. I'm actually on vacation. I'll be on vacation until January 2nd, but I'm still planning on bringing content. Uh, so please go to dozensarney.com and subscribe. Um, and yesterday, or well, at the time I recorded this, it was yesterday, but it was actually uh, a couple of days ago now at the time of airing, uh, New York State dropped uh, the ruling on the redistricting, which will now bring the redistricting of the congressional districts back to the redistricting commission in New York state. Um, and, uh, you know, this is just a brand new ruling. I haven't had time to really sit down, but that's okay because next week is redistricting week. Um, not only am I going to spend my entire commissioner in the car about talking about how the redistricting is going to work, uh, going forward, I'm going to be talking to Jeff Weiss, uh, of the New York uh, Law University. He's uh, been on our program several times, especially a couple of years ago when we were going through redistricting and he's coming on again uh, to kind of walk us through everything that's going to go. And he'll be on my Zoom with Zarni next week. So if you have questions about redistricting, tune in next week. We're going to talk all about the process uh, as we uh, you know look for new maps in the new year for the congressional districts in New York State. Uh, but that's all I have today. Please uh, stay tuned for Erica Smitka of the New York State League of Women Voters. Bye-bye. And I'm back, and I'm very happy to have my uh, good friend, Erica Smitka. She's the Deputy Director of the League of Women Voters of New York State. She's been on our program a couple of times. Erica, thanks so much for coming on Zoom with Zarni. Thank you so much for having me, Dustin. It's always a pleasure. So uh, here we are. Uh, we're at, you know, we usually talk around the end of uh, end of the year, beginning of the year, uh, in kind of a recap of uh, you know where we are and where we're hoping to go. But I know you know I'm very familiar with the League of Women Voters, but I think uh, you know many people don't know what the league is, and you know. So why don't you tell us a little bit about the history of the League of Women, Women Voters? and what you are and what, what kind of organization you are. Yeah, sure, I'd be happy to. Um, so the League has a long, long history, as, as you know, we're over 100 years old at this point. Um, and it truly was an organization that was born out of the women's suffrage movement. So um, the women's um, suffrage movement, it was essentially just a name change um, in 1919 for the New York State League that turned us into to the League. And it was once women realized, okay, we've, we've won the right to vote, um, what do we do now, right? We've done all this organizing, all this on the ground work. Now, how do we harness that power uh, and work together to, to really ensure that our vote has power and that we're not just kind of listening to the folks who have been voting for you know, decades, decades before us, um, but we're really voting for our own, you know, in our own interest. So, um, so the league was started then. We have always been kind of a voting rights organization, um, but we also worked a lot on on women's issues in the past, things like child care, equal pay, um, and we continue to work on a variety of issues, um, you know, straight through 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 now through twenty twenty three. Um, we are a uh, an organization that has many levels. So we have a, a national league. Um, uh, and then we have leagues in almost all 50 states. We have one expat league in Hong Kong. Um, and then within each each state, we have local leagues. So here in New York State, we have 43 local leagues across the state that range from Plattsburgh to Buffalo, all the way out to, um, to the tip of Long Island. Uh, and so our local leagues are really our 
boots on the ground, the folks that you're going to run into when you're registering to vote, um, the folks that are going to be talking to you about important ballot measures, uh, the folks that are really in your own community who who you probably see as as the face of your league. Uh, those are our local leagues, and they really do put in the work to uh, ensure that all voters across New York State have as much info as they need to um, to get out to the polls and to know what they're going to see on their ballots. And shout out to our local league here in Onondaga, the Metro Syracuse, the League of Women Voters. They're uh... You can, right. I'll throw them into the, uh, into the show notes. And I, I, what I found, um, you know, you are a nonpartisan group, but yes. you do, uh, much like our, um, you know, our, our elections boards, at least in New York state, you, I know the league tries to have as many equal representation of, you know, Democrat Republican views in, inside your league. You're not a single, uh, you know, ideological uh, league. You, you're you much more nuanced than many of the other nonpartisan groups that are out there that tend to be more left center. Uh, you know, the league is for voting rights, but you also have, you know, Republican members, Democratic members, especially at the local chapters. I've noticed that there's co-chairs right. or or something like that. I mean, it, what kind, why do you think it's very, uh, you know, uh, important to have those voices from both parties inside the League of Women Voters? Yeah, we uh, uh, thanks for bringing this up, Dustin. We always the league. Uh, we always come back to this point, right? That we are we're nonpartisan. We don't um, adhere to one party or the other, but we do focus on issues, and that's really at the heart of almost all of, of what the league does, right? We don't really care when you get to the the polling booth who you're going to vote for. We just want you to get out and vote and to participate in your democracy. Um, and when it comes to issues, we don't really care, you know, which which side of the issue you're on. We just want people to to get involved in issues that affect them in their daily lives, in their local communities across New York State. Um, and really being able to be representative of um, kind of a, a wider breadth of New Yorkers also allows us to have um, you know, we we like to think that folks look at us through kind of an unbiased lens because that's how we approach each and every issue, every debate. We give everyone the same, you know, it's all we try to be just about as fair as possible when it comes to to floor time and giving people the opportunity to um, candidates, the opportunity to to talk to their voters. So um, it's all about kind of that knowledge and that information and being able to give it to people in the most unbiased and factually based way as uh, as we possibly can. So that's why we really kind of hold on strong to our, our nonpartisanship um, and love to have a variety of different folks um, from different political backgrounds as, a, as members of the league. So as deputy director, what is your role with the League of Women Voters? Yeah, I do a lot, a lot of different things, but um, I primarily, uh, we have run into each other up at the Capitol during legislative session, um, primarily advocating for different issues, different bills that the league has been working on, um, and then also working with with local leagues, either to help build up advocacy efforts um, within our local leagues across the state, uh, or even just assisting local leagues in, in some of the educational work that we do year round. So um, a little bit of everything, but I think that's probably the best uh, snapshot I can give you. So, uh, Erica, you know, we're, we're, we're at the end of 2023. We've certified the elections. We're all, all starting to take a break, but that's not what you're doing. You're actually starting to ramp up. But what do you think are some of the important stories of 2023? Maybe reforms that you saw get put in place that you liked or didn't like uh, that you're, uh, you know, that, that you want to reflect on? Yeah, there was a lot of there were a lot of really great things that happened in 2023. Um, and a few of the things that we were really excited about, we were really excited to see the um the pre-registration bill pass. The it was a Shelley Mayer bill, um, that will make it easier and really kind of um. Uh, ensure that school boards um come up with plans for schools to be able to come up with a plan to register pre-register more students within within schools. Um, and what we found there was a a study that was put out by um, of course, the name is going to uh, to escape me at the moment. Um, but it really just showed the, you know, even though New Yorkers now have this this fantastic right to be able to pre-register as 16 and 17 year olds, uh, folks just aren't doing it. And so what does that come down to? Right. Is it is it access? Is it um, just education about it? Um, and where do folks get most of 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 what they're learning, right? As as youth is in school, so being able to ensure that a plan is in place to to pre-register students is, I think, really going to help those numbers grow, and help to encourage students to, um, you know, get more involved in their own democracy from an early age, which we know 
will ensure that they uh, they will probably be a uh, a continued voter for for many many years of their life if uh, if they do get engaged early. So we're very excited about that bill. Um, we're also very excited about the poll worker training bill. Um, I think that in many past years and in recent years, um, that was probably some of the biggest feedback we got from our local leagues across the state when it came to election day. Just that people were having um, pretty different experiences when they showed up at the polls, whether it be uh, what they were asked by poll workers um, when they showed up to the um, to sign in or um, whether it be you know, whatever it might be, folks were really just having some pretty divergent experiences. Um, and that's not how it should be, right? When folks go to the polls, everybody should have, uh, you know, just as similar an experience as a person, you know, in Syracuse would have compared to a person out in Montauk. Um, so that everybody's given, again, the kind of the same opportunity, the same, um, the same chance to, to, to vote in a way that is, is, um, is uh you know easy and facilitates kind of the, the ease of voting there so um having something in place that will hopefully kind of standardize some of the training that poll workers are, are given across the state is something that we uh are, are really excited to to see happen well we're we at boards of elections are interested in that too because we want to see how this is going to work as well <laughs> but i mean we we expect that to be more of a train the trainer type of uh uh, program, you know, it's not going to be a one size fit all, you know, standard, but it's going to allow us to get a what is needed in a certification class for inspectors and what. And then, of course, the county boards will add in their own processes and, and, and that kind of thing. So we're very excited about that, too. Um, so, you know, both of us are starting to gear up. You said we, we meet in the halls of Albany every now and then. We do, you know. Uh, I'm always happy to see you and my fellow uh, league uh, friends, but, uh, um, you know, all of us have different, um, you know, ideologies and different uh, things that we want to get, uh, you know, done in 2024. Um, you know, session will be shorter because it's an even year, so they try to get out of there a little bit earlier in June, uh, you know, so they can go uh attend to their primaries and, and other things. Yeah. So, but uh, what, you know, but it, and it's going to start earlier. It's going to start January 3rd. It's right around the corner. It's that, you know, it's, it's usually starts middle of January. They're, they're starting January 3rd this year. Um, what are your, uh, what are the league's priorities or some of the priorities you're hoping to focus on in, in 2024? Yeah, you know, we've done a lot of thinking around this because 2024 is a huge election year, right? You know, we're going to see, it's not only going to be a presidential election year, we're going to see, uh, you know, plenty of, of statewide elections, and then we're also going to see a pretty big um, ballot measure on the ballot. The New York State Equal Rights Amendment will be on the ballot. So um, the league has really been looking at, okay, how are we going to ensure that voters turn out? Um, how are we going to ensure that voters are educated? And and what does that look like? Um, and so one of the the things that, that we keep running into has really been um, kind of around mis and disinformation around elections um, and how can you again ensure that voters are getting that information and, and getting accurate information. Um, and a part of that is that New York State's um, voter rolls are, are just about, you know, Boards of elections work incredibly hard to ensure that they are just as updated as possible. But something that would make it a little bit more simple um, would be the Eric bill that was introduced last year. <laughs> Which Sorry, I, I, I'm glad to hear you say that because this is the first I heard that you're getting behind that. But because yeah. our caucus, um, the Democratic caucus, got behind the Eric bill last session and we couldn't get agreement from the Republican caucus on this. And we're, we're we don't understand because and the attacks on Eric nationwide. Uh, for those who don't know what Eric is, can you kind of explain Eric and then we can get into why this is such an important, uh, you know, uh, step? Absolutely. So I'm forever, or forever forgetting the the what the acronym stands for. So I looked it up just before our call. So it's the Electronic Registration Information Center. Um, and essentially what it does is it just allows New York State to keep better uh, voter rolls. So if a, a New York State voter were to move to Connecticut, um, for example, it would be it allows state voter rolls to, to really kind of work together to ensure that, you know, that voter's registration would be 
be would be updated once they made that move. Um, I, th- I always go back to that example, but do you have any other examples, Dustin, that might be kind of tangible for folks when it comes to Eric? I think that's the most, like, you know, right now people don't realize that not every state, uh, you know, shares information when a voter gets registered in another state and, and they've moved from New York state. They may have registrations open in New York and in Florida. Um, and unfortunately, for those who want to commit voter fraud, that becomes the easiest way to do so. You usually get a an absentee from one place and vote in person in the other and you we see that, you know, we've seen a lot of that around the villages in New York or in Florida, the villages, a large retirement community that, uh, you know, is from other states. And we're seeing a lot of uh, in-person voting there and they're voting absentees at their home place. And uh, usually that's purposeful, not uh, accidental. And, uh, you know, and, and Eric is uh, the, the the second attempt at a uh, an interstate compact that would allow these states to share, but not every state is in it. And in fact, fewer states now are in it than yeah. they were before because Eric has been attacked wrongfully by some of the election deniers out there um, as some kind of conspiracy when it actually, what it does is it actually prevents voter fraud as opposed to, you know, that they that they claim is out there. And I still don't understand the logical reason behind that. I don't think there is one, unfortunately. But uh, so, you know, what we need as advocates to do is to encourage big states to join Eric to start propping it up. And I don't think people realize that like big states like New York and California that are considered left leaning states are not a part of this important uh, you know, election tool. And um, I I have found that one of the reasons that New York is not a part of it, at least, is that uh, Eric also requires um, registration, uh, you know, requirements of uh, local boards of elections or, you know, and, and, and advocates to, to do attempts at uh, registering in underserved communities so they're not... Uh, you know, unwittingly moved, removed off the rolls. And apparently that's some kind of sin. <laughs> I don't get it. Yeah. You know, the horrible yeah. thing that to actually require people to be registered to vote. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, it, it really is pretty wild. I, I Yes, I was reading a bunch of articles recently, um, right, that all kind of came out within the past year about states leaving. And it just simply, I mean, it's a simple solution. You know, it's a simple solution to, to something that's, I... I just seems like it should be an obvious, an obvious win, but here we are. So, um, so we would love to see Eric pass this year. Um, you know, it's it's more important now than ever. Um, and so we would would absolutely love to see that. Um, there's some some um, some that we've been working on for for a few years that we'd really like to see the um, uh, New York Voting Rights Act, the database, which was talked about last year. Um, so we're hoping to to see that kind of go through fairly easily, fingers crossed, this year. Um, we uh, something that we haven't talked about in a little while, but the league definitely doesn't want it to to fall off uh, anybody's plate. Would be same day voter registration, which was introduced as a bill last year. Um, don't really know if if uh, it's going to have the traction or or if folks will have the appetite to to pick it up again this year. But um, you know, the league we really feel like the more we can kind of consistently push for this, um, it's it is a constitutional amendment, so it's going to take a while to to get into the hands of voters. Um, and it is something that could truly really you know revolutionize the uh, uh, the way that New York State elections work. Um, and this year, one of the uh, the other great wins of last year um, was the reduction of the um, uh, voter registration to um, move it down to the constitutional minimum of 10 days, which allowed for one golden day in which somebody could register to vote uh, and vote on the same day. Um, So we had a little kind of trial run of that this year. Um, And I'm sure you could speak to it more clearly uh, being right on the ground. But, um, you know, I think from what we've heard, it went just about as well as it could could have, which I think shows that New York State is ready for for something like same day voter reg, which again would uh, would just ensure that we get as many voters out there as possible. Well, we're doing it in the easiest way possible by you know just plumping up the affidavit system. We're not trying to do live registrations at polling places and then and letting them cast ballots on the machine. I thought it was a good um, first step. Uh, uh, 
I, I can tell you, you know, when I do my stats, uh, we just certified because we had a hand count. So I'm about a, you know, three weeks behind of where I want to look at, at some of the stats, but the affidavits, we, I, I can't remember. I don't, I think it was less than 10 affidavits out of like, se you know, several hundred that were cast in my county that were rejected, uh, you know, uh, that, uh, that should not, you know, that, and, and part of that is the wrong church, wrong pew, you know, was, was re repealed. And part of that is allowing people to register on that first day of early voting, you know, and allowing those to be counted. Um, the proof will be next year when we have like, you know, a ton of first time voters coming out, a ton of lazy voters coming out. Yeah, you know, say lazy, but like not yeah. often voters coming out. Right. Yeah. Um, but, you know, and, and we'll see how these, uh, how these law, um, you know, uh, holds up to that when we have this deluge at the end of the voting cycle, but we'll have to see. Um, i but I was a supporter of those too. So I was glad to see it was a lot more work for the boards of elections. And that's why, it was. you know, uh, we need, I hope that the legislature will seriously look at, um, structural uh, issues when it comes to budgeting and uh, the Board of Elections, because we're seeing this large trend of counties unwilling to put in the money towards their boards of elections, especially in, in uh, right leaning, uh, you know, government, uh, you know, and, they, and unfortunately, they, they don't see the value in putting the money towards boards. And some of them are just outright saying that they're not doing it because they don't like the reforms that have been passed. And this is a way to to, you know, tell New York State, well, you have to pay for this, you know, and, that, and, and, and it's a dangerous game because, you know, democracy is run at the county level, it's not at the state level, you know, and that's, that's problematic. H has the league looked into that at all? I mean, you know, the, the you know, you've always been an incredible supporter of boards of elections. Uh, are, is the league looking into, you know, those kind of issues as well? Yeah, we, we haven't, we haven't just yet, um, but it's certainly something that we're, you know, we're, as we gear up for budget session, right, we're, um, we're, we're looking at, okay, yeah, what, how can we best support uh, local county boards of elections and, and what do they really need on the ground? Um, and so we'll, we'll absolutely kind of dig into that uh, just about as, as, as best we can, because, um, right, what's, what's the point of, of passing a law if it essentially becomes an unfunded mandate or if it only becomes available for some New Yorkers and, and not for others simply based on, on the funds that are, um, that are made available for folks. Uh, and a lot of it, as you said, is um, either just counties are unwilling to give that money to elections um, or counties simply, right, they're, they're kind of pinching, pinching pennies. Um, and so we really need to see, and we'll be, you know, at the budget hearing again <laughs> this year, we'll probably see you there, um, really pushing to ensure that the state gives, gives the, the funding that, that is so sorely needed for our, our county boards of elections. So Eric, you know, as we, uh, you know, go into 2024, uh, we we talked briefly at the beginning of uh, you know or not at the beginning but before we got on camera here, uh, you know about uh, the bill that was just signed into law um, that uh, required sheriffs to work with county boards of elections to register uh, you know uh, you know populations inside jails uh, or that are awaiting their trials um, you know that are that uh, are eligible to vote but. Uh, you know, are are either not registered or not getting their absentee ballots. So, what um tell tell us a little bit about why this is important to focus on, and 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 what you know what are what's the goal of this type of uh, uh, enfranchisement. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the goal is is essentially just that, right? To ensure that every single New Yorker who has the right to vote is able to to. Um, to vote to cast that ballot, um, the it, it really is by not allowing for equal access to to the ballot within our our jail or our, our carceral system, um, really is a, a form of voter suppression by process, um, which unfortunately frequently disproportionately affects low income citizens, uh, folks who are unable to post bail and still awaiting trial, um, and then it also frequently uh, primarily. Um, affects uh, black and brown voters across New York State. Um, in 2023, for example, 73% um, of New York State's uh, pre-trial population was uh, black or Latino Latina. So um, 
you know, to see uh, those numbers and then knowing that um, it, truly the the ability to cast a ballot often comes down to to the sheriff in that county. Um, that's just not not what what democracy is is based on, and not what we really should be seeing here in New York State. Yeah, and I think people forget that we're not talking about felons that have been convicted and are in, uh, you know, are are in prison. We're talking about either people that are in jail awaiting, um, you know, uh, their, you know, their 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 innocent until proven guilty, and they're awaiting their time their trial, or they've been convicted of a misdemeanor and have a smaller sentence, um, and and yet still have the right to vote and uh you know we did a lot in new york to roll back some of the more restrictive um you know punitive measures about when you know somebody served their time now it used to be that if they were out on parole but they're not finished their parole they couldn't get their uh uh you know their voting rights back and then for a while the governor was issuing then governor cuomo was issuing you know clemencies which were onerous and and, and yeah. hard to know how you were going to get. And now, you know, we put into law that it basically if you're out on the street, you know, if you're out on parole, if you're not in the physical building, uh, you can now get your voting rights back. Um, but now the last step is for the people that are in the building that, you know, have a legal right to cast a ballot, giving them uh, the ability to do that. Um, you know, so I, I admire the work there. Yeah, you know, it really is based on, um, uh, you know, there's a few a few things and a few other reasons I think that re that really um, kind of highlight why it's so important. And some of that comes down to to reentry, right? When when somebody continues to be a part of their community by participating in something as simple as casting their ballot while while they may be detained, um, that that again continues to link them to their community and continues to um, to give them a voice and to give them the the ability to to care about about kind of this larger population, um, and we found that you know the more involved folks are with their own community um, as they they re-enter the population, that recidivism rate is is really much lower. Um, and so why uh, you know there's no need to kind of take away something that that somebody, as you said, obviously has the has the right to, especially if it will only continue to to help folks as they ease back into re-entry um, and and to to help folks know that. That they are still still a part of our the community and uh, and that their vote should should show that um, we we actually did a study this past summer the league did um, where we looked at what this looks like in in uh, jails all across New York State we looked at uh, fifty seven counties so we didn't take a look at at New York City um, but we looked at fifty seven counties across the state um, just to see you know what kind of policies and procedures are in place and what does this look like for for folks who are detained in in different counties um, and what we found is that voting typically depended um you know very strongly on the authority of the sheriff and not necessarily on existing uh new york state law um and so that's that's just not fair right you know you shouldn't um just because you you are detained in a certain county uh, and and a sheriff isn't letting um, perhaps community organization like the league um, come on in and help register voters, that doesn't mean that that your vote should be taken away. So um, we actually found that only eleven out of the fifty seven counties had some sort of program in place to ensure that folks didn't lose their their right to vote while being detained. So I mean that's a that's a, a shockingly high percentage of of jails across New York State that. Um, that are you know essentially participating in that in that voter suppression by um, just not giving folks the the access that they they deserve. So the law now you know the new law that was passed is actually a you know the focus is on the sheriff right it's it, it's the sheriff's responsibility to come up with a program but involve the board of elections too. So it's not like you know I'm not walking into the prison to like you know and saying hey I'm here you know this is a coordinated effort it's a uh, you know, it, it, it has to, you know, it has to be done in a way that's secure and safe, but also in a way that is, uh, you know, respectful to the people that are inside as well. So, again, you know, it, it's going to still be a county by county basis because those plans have to be done on a county by county basis. But now there's a requirement of the sheriff to have a good faith effort in, in doing this. So, yeah, that's, and that's, a, that's that's what needs to be done. <laughs> and I mean, that, right. 
because you know if they're not opening the door then uh, and providing you know this as a, a service a lot of times they use security as a reason not to do this and uh, exactly now that now they have to uh you know come up with a plan so right right and dustin we're talking about the brisport bill right yeah yeah. So and the, so the interesting thing too about that one is that um, it primarily focuses on when folks are are leaving jail, which is which is great and and super helpful, right? If we can if we can catch folks, you know, right as they're as they're leaving jail, whether they need to re-register or, or whatever that might be, um, that that is truly fantastic. One of the other bills that we're going to be looking at this year is a bill that was uh, introduced last year by Senator Myrie, um, which would create kind of like a more uniform voter access policy. Um, it would essentially kind of uh, mirror the system that we currently use in places like nursing homes, right, where you've got a large number of people who can't leave that establishment to go out to vote um, and would allow counties and sheriffs to kind of create a similar system within uh, within their jail in, in a way that works for them, right, because it's you know, as we've said, every county doesn't have the same funding. Every, you know, every um, every system doesn't look the same. So um, whatever that would look like for that county, this bill would ensure something is in place so that um, so that again, that that uniform kind of voter access is there. So we're going to work on that this year and uh, and we'll see where it goes. But... So, Eric, you know, as we're, you know, we're kind of getting towards that magic time here where I think it's time to start wrapping up. But, uh, you know, I, I always like to wrap up with like my favorite question because it's so easy for me to say, but to, harder for you to answer. What is something that we haven't talked about uh, that you want to get out there uh, for the listeners of the program or, um, you know, or, or just uh, something that we haven't touched on, uh, you know, this program that you'd like to get out there? Yeah. Okay. Well, I, Dustin, I've got to use this time to uh, to really promote the league's um, kind of like one stop shop for for election information. Oh, that's perfect. Yeah, we we haven't talked about that. I love that the the vote. You're talking about the four one one there. The yep. yeah. Go ahead. Yes, let's do it. Okay, great. All right, perfect. Um, so if you have any questions um, this year as we're approaching the elections, um, you should go to the league's website, vote four one one dot org. Um, it's it operates. We operate. Uh, nationwide, but you will be able to go in, plug in your address, and you will get um, incredibly specific information for, you know, essentially all you need to know before you head to the polls. You can find out where your early voting poll site is, you can find out your regular voting poll site, find out what's going to be on your ballot. Um, you can also find out um, our local leagues uh, and our state league will be hard at work um, interviewing candidates um, on issues, topics that are important to New Yorkers across the state. Um, and so you'll be able to read candidates' answers to those questions right on, on Vote 411. So you've got a little bit more information before you head to the polls. Um, you'll see information about ballot proposals on there. Um, really anything you need to know or any questions that you might have can typically be answered by Vote 411 or it will link directly to our um, County Board of Elections websites so that um, all of the fantastic information that you put out there, Dustin, is um, is is hopefully right at the fingertips for folks. So um, as a, we'd love to see folks head there um, this election season. Yeah, uh, I mean, I, the Vote Four One One is a is a great tool because while I love my website, I do. Uh, I love OnVote.net. If you're in Onondaga County, it's still a county website. It's not a um, you know, it's you still have, we're still under the county shell and all of that. And so sometimes it's a little, you know, you kind of got to know what you're looking for to get there. You can get a lot of stuff there, but you got to know what it, what I like about vote 411 is that it's a little bit more um, user-friendly for first time voters, for people that, you know, don't, don't know what a county board of elections is. I mean, right. not everybody does, yeah. you know, and, um, I, and, and, and you mentioned ballot proposals. One of the things that we didn't talk about, but a bill that I'm excited about uh, that just got signed recently was the, uh, you know, to, to to make sure that all ballot proposals yes. are of an eighth grade reading level. So people know what they're voting for. It's a, it's one of the biggest questions we ever have when we have ballot proposals on there. People will say, what are we voting for? Tell us how to vote. I'm like, we can't tell you how to vote. That's, you know, and yeah. if it's at an eighth grade reading level, then people can make decisions while they're in the polling place. If okay they haven't done their research ahead of time. And, you know, a lot of people don't. So it, it's uh, it's important. To, it, that's an important change. So I'm really excited about that this year. So. Yeah. 
I'm so glad you brought that up, Dustin. I can't believe I forgot about that. We are thrilled with that that passed. Um, and one of the other great things it'll do, right, is, yeah, it's not only an eighth grade reading level, but it'll tell someone uh, if this proposal passes, then, and it will kind of give an example of how it would play out in real life, or if it doesn't pass, then. Um, and having that tangible kind of knowledge while somebody's at the at the poll site is, is, uh, is critical. So, yeah, we're absolutely excited about that, too. Thanks for bringing it up. Yeah. Well, you know, it's going to be uh, an interesting year. It's always kind of a, you know, presidential elections are something different, you know, than anything else we do. It's the, it's the highest voter turnout. It's the highest number of registrants. It's, uh, you know, and this presidential election, unfortunately, I believe will be one of the most stressful of, uh, you know, in, in, in all of our um, you know, all of our, you know, presidential elections that we've had. And it, it's, we've seen, you know, over the last four years, the uh, what happened at the end of the last presidential election with the insurrection and, and uh, you know, in the ongoing fallout from that. And during this presidential election, we're going to have trials of probably one of the major party candidates. And I think there's going to be a huge stress test on our electoral system. I do believe we're going to rise to the challenge, but we're only going to be able to do that with advocates like the League of Women Voters out there, um, you know, having a, uh, you know, ha helping us with the public, which you do, and, you know, and, and, and getting people to believe in the system again. And that's, uh, you know, so I want to thank the League and you, Erica, you know, for being a good friend and uh, a friend of democracy uh, in and of itself, so. Absolutely. Well, thank you, Dustin, for all of the the incredibly hard work that you do. You work far too hard for people to question the system in any way. So um, uh, we absolutely appreciate you more than we could say. Well, thank you again. And check the show notes. Go join your local league. It's not just for women. Uh, you know, it's a league of women voters, but there are male and female members uh, that are that are in the league. And you know, Democrat, Republican, non-enrolled, it doesn't matter. If you're in, if you are enthusiastic about making sure people have the right to vote, uh, and that they choose that right to vote, please go and join your League of Women Voters. It's one of the biggest advocacy groups out there, and you can check the show notes. Erica, thank you so much for coming on Zoom with Zarni. Thank you so much for having me, Dustin. It was a pleasure. And that was my interview with Erica Smith uh, of the League of Women Voters, a, a great advocate and a great organization. Uh, go check their uh, out their links in the show notes. And uh, uh, this weekend on my weekly walk, I'll be moving on into uh, analyzing early voting and possibly absentee voting in the 2023 general election. Uh, and uh, right up, I have up on the weekly walk the uh, how Democrats fared in 2023. A new segment I did uh, since last year was a local year. I really wanted to see how Democrats did as compared to other local years and other uh things with so many uh, um, uh, options on the ballot. Commissioner Carr next week, we'll, I'll be focusing in on the redistricting ruling, uh, kind of laying out what the process is. And then my Zoom with Zarni next week will be Jeff Weiss, a uh, professor at New York Law University, but a foremost expert in redistricting. He's been on our program before, but he's coming on again to talk about what we're going to see now in New York State uh, as we look at a new congressional map. This will be the third congressional map since redistricting. So check it out. Remember to go to DustinZarni.com. You can subscribe for free, get content uh, and election news updates uh, by email. Uh, it'll always be free, and it's uh, wholly paid for out of my pocket as I uh, believe that this is part of my educational duties as uh, an elections commissioner in Onondaga County. Thank you very much. And enjoy your day. Bye-bye.